Today, we are going to read The Spring River Flows East, an article about the importance of collective work in the foundation of Huawei. It was written in December 2011 by Mr. Ren Zhenfei, CEO and founder of Huawei. When I was a boy, my mother told us the story of the Greek demigod Hercules. We greatly revered him. We were young and ignorant. We admired heroes such as Li Yuanba and Yuan Chandu, and often told absurd stories about how Chang Fei fought with and sometimes even killed Yue Fei. When, during our teens, we read a line from one of Li Qingzhao's literary works, Alive be a man of men, dead be a soul of souls, we suddenly realized that Xian Yu, another Chinese equivalent of Hercules, could be her most beloved hero. As such, we made this line our motto. This individualistic heroism was not meaningless to us, because it inspired us to study hard and excel at school. It was not until many years after I stepped into society that I finally realized that I always referred back to this simple philosophy from my youth whenever there was a hard lesson to learn. I was unable to join the Communist Yao League when I was at college and failed to join the Communist Party when I served in the army. There was always adversity in my life and I became isolated. It was not until I was in my 40s that I understood the political connotation of the saying solidarity means strength. When I think about all the time I wasted, I wonder why I was so childish and didn't understand openness, compromise and quaidu. I found the Huawei when I encountered difficulties. At that time, I realized that the strength of one person is like a grain of sand in the sweep of history. This is what our life is like. When I saw the windy, mountainous roads of Yunnan, I couldn't help wondering how people planned and built these roads over a hundred years ago in such dangerous locations. I greatly admired the wisdom and painstaking efforts of the road builders. When I saw the thin silk cloths marvelously woven with lifelike flowers, I was filled with admiration for the female weavers. Similarly astounding are the engineering feats of the winding Great Wall, the tenacity of the short hands that drag boats up river with nothing but their physical strength, and the quickness of the lighting fast high spill rail lines. I became to the deep realization that there is infinite strength in organizations and collective efforts. We can accomplish great things only if we realize that we, in and of ourselves, are not that significant. I was in my 40s when Huawei was founded. What does it mean to be in one's 40s? Age is a yardstick used to measure the wisdom of a man. During the several thousand years of feudalism, change was slow and a man had time to matter slowly. There is a Chinese saying that says, when a man turns 40, he is considered to be free from doubts. When I was 40, the computer era was dawning, and the world became wild and frantic. There was no time for me to learn to be a wise man. I was once an excellent Chinese young man, a so-called expert, but I suddenly realized that I was becoming increasingly ignorant. For me, Hitting 40 didn't mean I was free from doubts. Instead, it meant I had to start a new journey of study. The fast-changing dynamics of the era did not give me any chance or time to build up my self-confidence. The road ahead was full of uncertainties. I had intended to take on technical jobs or do some scientific research when I first arrived in Shenzhen. I would have been thrown onto the garbage heap a long time ago by the rapidly changing times if I had continued along that road. I came to understand later that no matter how diligent someone is, no one can keep pace with the times, not to mention keeping up with the information age characterized by this explosion of knowledge. Only after we organized dozens, hundreds and thousands of people to work and strive together could we step up on the demands of the times. When I started the Huawei, I no longer acted as a technical expert. I became an organizer. In those fast changing times, I became increasingly unfamiliar with new developments in technology and finance, and only knew a few things about management. 
If I fail to treat the team kindly, keep an open mind and leverage the full potential of our heroes in Huawei, I would not have been able to achieve anything. Organization building became my pursuit in the later years. It was a great challenge for me to organize the tens of thousands who made up the Huawei workforce. When Huawei was established, it was a small private employer. Maybe it was too ambitious and not the right time for such a small company to organize so many people to work for it. We were considering something that was a bit unimaginable, almost like a toad trying to catch a swan for its meat. During Huawei's inception, I designed the Employee Stock Ownership Plan. This benefit sharing plan united Huawei employees together. At that time, I had no idea what a stock option system was and was unaware that Western companies had already developed this kind of incentive systems. The frustrations in my own life made me feel obligated to share both responsibilities and benefits with the employees. I discussed these approaches with my father. He had studied economics in the 1930s and was able to give me a lot of support and advice in this matter. These flowers that I unintentionally planted are now in full bloom and it is precisely what has made Huawei the success it is today. In Huawei early years, I gave the guerrilla heads of our offices in different locations full autonomy to act as they saw fit. As a matter of fact, I really didn't have the capacity to lead them. During the first decade, we rarely had staff team meetings. I flew to different parts of the country to listen to the reports of the guerrilla heads. I understood their situations and supported their actions. I listened to the plethora of ideas from the R&D staff. Our R&D at that time was a mess, which made it nearly impossible for us to have clear direction. The R&D staff hopped and bumped around like a ball in a pinball machine. As soon as they heard customer requirements that requested improvement, they would do their best to turn these requirements into opportunities. Financial management was even a bigger challenge for me because I knew nothing about it. This lack of knowledge directly resulted in my poor relationship with the finance staff, and promotions for them were rare. My incapacity and ignorance made delegating authority a necessity. Subsequently, Lutz from various locations had an opportunity to give full play to their potential, which made Huawei what it is today. At that time, people at Huawei called me a hands-off boss. That was not because I wanted to be like that, but because I didn't know how to manage the company. Today's successors at Huawei are the best of the best. Will they be as ignorant as I was? Will they continue to delegate authority to try to tap into the full potential of all Huawei employees while following past traditions and blazing trails for future generations? The cost of pursuit is grander and the responsibility they bear is even greater. Will they be too busy to listen to what other people are saying? I have confidence in the applied inertia of Huawei as well as the wisdom of my successors. This is the end of the first part of the article.